Hello and welcome to episode two of the Power Chat Forum. Today I have two incredible guests. Uh, not only are they some of my closest friends in this community, uh, they are absolute rock stars and legends. Uh, we have the one and only Emma Darcy coming straight to us from Philadelphia with Oscar the Cat uh, making a special cameo appearance. High five, Oscar. Wow. No, no, not, not today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you'll know Emma. She's a regular fixture at a lot of CRM UGs and D365 UGs, as well as participating in hackathons, giving talks on things like imposter syndrome, UCI controls. So I'm very honored to have the one and only Emma Darcy here today. Uh, and next, we have a man who needs no introduction, uh, but I'm going to try and give him one the best I can. Uh, you all know him as Chris Huntingford, uh, the old caps uh, tattooed <laughs> CRM guy. Uh, you know him as part of TDG and one and numerous other communities that he's helped set up over the last few years uh, to help bring everyone together. Uh, he now currently resides at Microsoft, and we have the one and only Chris Huntingford. Hello. Hey guys, I was going to high five someone, but you know, these has got a cat. I'm just going to listen to <laughs> just, just stop it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How are you guys doing today? Yeah, solid. It's uh, 2 p.m. for me, so it's kind of the middle of my work day. So kind of just getting started, really, to be honest. Don't tell anyone. Well, we won't, we won't, tell, uh, don't, we won't tell your boss that you're striving off work to come talk to me today. So, uh, but I appreciate both of you taking the time out of your uh, busy schedules because you both do have busy schedules. This, we're recording this the week after MBAS, which is the week after the hack for good, which I think is going to be a big conversation uh, piece in this. But let's, I, I'm a big uh, comic book fan. So I always like to start with origin stories. So I kind of want to know, um, firstly, who you guys are, and then we're going to go on to, um, you know, <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be the entire chat. It's just Oscar eating my hair. This is already the best podcast ever. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, let's, uh, let's start with you, Emma. Uh, give us an introduction sure. of who you are, who you work for and what you sort of do. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Emma Darcy, also known as Tattooed CRM Girl. I think this is the first time Chris and I have both been on the same podcast. So the world might actually implode a little bit. <laughs> Almost <laughs> so like I, I planned it that way. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. I don't know why it hasn't been done before, um, but I work for Click Dimensions. I am a pre-sales consultant. I've been there for three and a half years now, but I have actually been working in the dynamic space for about eight or nine years. Kind of started off as a user like most people and then moved to the Americas, the magical world of the Americas, and then got involved in marketing and implementing dynamics from there. But yeah, that's, that's what I'm currently doing. I'm nice. getting my hair eaten by a cat. Well, you know, cats will do that. Yeah. Um, I, I did have a question about your, your job. <laughs> I think you're losing Chris a little bit. Um, I did have a question about your job role. So pre-sales sure. consultant for, for Click Dimensions. Yes. Do you, do you see yourself as a dynamics person first and a marketeer second? Or like, is it kind of somewhere, somewhere in between? I have never been asked that question before. I would definitely say dynamics person first, for sure. Just because, you know, obviously Click Dimensions is built on top of the dynamics platform. And so having a broader understanding of how dynamics works really plays a huge part into my role. So as a pre-sales consultant, traditionally pre-sales consultants, and Chris can definitely back me up on this, you're going to be the expert in your solution. Whereas Click Dimensions itself is, is not a huge solution like the dynamics platform itself, right? So as a pre-sales consultant for Click Dimensions, my role means that I have to also be very knowledgeable in the dynamic space as well so that I can provide an overall complete solution for a client rather than just something that's purely marketing based. Right. Nice. Yeah. So you need to be you need to be the master of every room that you go into to try yeah. and uh, yeah. try and give the best of trust. That's yeah. awesome. Especially like right now, a lot of people are using click dimensions for more than just marketing, given the current yeah. situation. Communication is so huge. So having that oh, yeah. broader understanding of how everything works together has been key. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and let's find out about you, Chris. So you, like Emma, as we can tell from the accent, hails from uh, Dublin, Ireland. Um, but uh, your accent, Chris, I didn't, I didn't realize what your accent was when I first met you. So let's find out all about you and how uh, and and what you do. Yeah. So I was going to say, um, I'll tell you who I am and what I do. But I have to say that Emma, I met Emma in for the first time probably. I think it was in Dublin. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and like two years ago. Yeah, and I was a. Uh, I met her through a mutual friend, and this dude was like, "Hey, man, you've got to meet this crazy lady. She's incredible. She basically knows everything there is to know about click dimensions and the technical side of things and more." And I'm like, "Oh, sweet, you know, because I've been doing click D for ages." I'm like, "Yeah, 
awesome. So I met Emma and I'm like, oh, okay, she just knows way more than I do. This is so uncool. So I like, I was talking to her about automation and stuff and it was epic because the first conversation I ever had with Emma was sitting around like this this weird little table at one of the one of the conferences chatting about marketing automation. It was epic. So yeah. Um, so I, I come from the uh, the deep south, which is South Africa, um, and I've been doing yeah I've been I've been in the UK for about nearly six years I think, and in Dynamics for eleven. It's a little wow. while. <laughs> yeah, um, I've, actually it's a weird story. I used to work at um, so before this I used to be a developer for Borland. Um, working in a company called Unico, which is like one of the sub parts of Borland. And um, I left and I started doing my, I started running my own business, traveling around South Africa, fixing courier and fleet management solutions and working on like Delphi 5, building out solutions, connecting to interbase databases. So what you guys know is like bubble sort procedures and paradox tables and stuff. That's what I used to do. And I actually got roped into a Microsoft partner at the time called IS Partners in South Africa, working in the South Africa Microsoft building uh, in Johannesburg. And yeah, I basically followed this lady around for quite a long time called Liz Wills. And yeah, she basically, her and a chap called Adrian taught me the ropes. I was in support and maintenance for, for about a year and a half. Moved into pre-sales and I was in pre-sales for not even kidding you, nine years. Or eight, no, eight years. Right. Yeah. Wow. Solution architecture and pre-sales. Yeah, it was awesome. But um, yeah, I moved to the UK, uh, interviewed at a couple of places, moved to Hitachi Solutions. And yeah, then came to Microsoft. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's yeah, that's an awesome journey, man. Like, especially like when you, I always find it really interesting how people get into this stuff. Like, I kind of fell into it from an end user perspective, and then just kind of didn't realize that people actually paid money for the things that I was doing for free. <laughs> uh, so all these different like strands of how people get into it is interesting. So Emma, how did how did you specifically get into it then? Just I I remember your story mm-hmm. from the oops factor uh, about um, the the. <laughs> Yeah. I, I yeah. That. So I'm just trying to think like how how did you how did you land in the dynamic space? Was it just kind of like you needed a change and then you uh you kind of fell into it a little bit? It's a little bit different in that. So way back when I used to work for a biotechnology company in Ireland and I was an application specialist. And actually the story of how I got into IT is actually really funny. I got into ID because I'm actually really good at video games and this is no lie, right? So in your resume or your CV back in Ireland, it's very common to put like your hobbies at the very bottom. I don't know if that's a thing in the UK, but it is in Ireland anyway. Yeah. And obviously one of my hobbies is playing video games, as you guys know. And um, I was a year and a half into college. I had to drop out of college because I couldn't afford to pay for it anymore. And I decided, whatever, I'm going to give it a go. I have some sort of an IT idea. And I applied for a couple of jobs. And one of them was an application specialist, which I had no idea what that was. So I go for the interview and they give you like this logic kind of thing, like a logic flow. And they're like, this is not a trick question. Okay. So just answer it the way you would normally answer. And it was super fucking easy. Can I swear? I'm going to swear. It was super easy. <laughs> they have an explicit tag on this. I was like, I didn't want to be the first one. I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah, it's explicit. It's, you know, it's going on Perfect. YouTube, but it's, it's, it's not for kids. And there's an explicit tag on the podcast. So you're all good. Perfect. All right. So it was super fucking easy. And I was going through the whole thing. And then I got to the end and they were like, oh my God, she got it right. She got it right. And I was like, this is the easiest thing I've ever had to answer. And so at the end of the, the interview, they were like, so you play uh, you play video games. How many times have you prestiged on Call of Duty? And I was like, oh, like three times, you know, I, I like to play every night and I, I really enjoy it. I also really like watching American Netflix, like on my Xbox by changing the DNS settings. And they were like, you know, you know what a DNS is? I'm like, yeah and they were like oh wow okay everyone else we've like been trying to hire for this knows what excel is and that's the closest thing we've gotten to an it person so i was driving they dropped me off to the train station because i couldn't drive either at the time they were like yeah we haven't had anybody else interview that really likes video games we think you might be a really good fit for this job purely because i like video (laughs) games so i got the job and the applications i was working were actually um ax which is the FNO side of things for dynamics yeah. at this stage. So I started working with AX, absolutely hated it. Accountants are the worst. I'm so sorry, but I just, I can't deal with accountants or inventory. None of that stuff's my jam. 
Uh, and because I have such a, I have a re- background in retail, they they decided that I would be a good fit for implementing a service desk using Dynamics. They're like, we have this E3 license, remember those days? Yeah. Uh, with this free thing called Dynamics CRM. I don't really know what it is. Can you figure out how to make it into an internal service desk? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll give it a go. And so I taught myself how to customize and configure Dynamics. And I did some classes at Dublin Microsoft. And then I got really oh. into it. It was way easier than a- AX. I didn't have to deal with accountants and users were significantly easier to handle and so that's how I got into dynamics and then once I moved to the states I had a very brief stint in ERP because that is my background uh, you know decimated a production server uh, quit on the spot and then moved back to CRM where things are way easier <laughs> yeah I mean we've we've all dropped databases before it's not you know we've all done that have you so. done it for a multi-million dollar company though that is the real question do you know what? No, no. I think I think you're the winner in that respect. So, um, coincidentally, I my first job that I got in the sort of IT space. I was straight out of university, and um, it was it was a two two part interview. So the first part, I go in, talk to the guy, and he's like, right, okay, um, I've got this test for you. I'm like, All right. So he hands me this test, and he says, I'll give you 15 minutes to complete it. 15 minutes. It's 98 questions on this test Jeez, in 15 nice. minutes. What do they expect you to do? I know, so anyway, I, I'm rattling through it the best I can. But the thing is, is I'm reading all these questions and I'm, I've come out of university. I have like a knowledge of, you know, basic programming, have a knowledge of basic IT, um, a lot of knowledge of databases, but n- and like networks and stuff, but not like um, day to day. It was a service desk I was applying for. So it's like IT service desk sort of stuff for bespoke software and, and hardware. Um, and I'm reading through this test and I'm just there like, I don't know the answer to any of these questions. I'm just like guessing at a lot of them. Um, there was one question on it that was on Windows 95. And at the end of the test, I gave it back to the guy that was interviewing me. He said, oh, how'd you find it? I said, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I didn't know all the answers. Um, I was seven when Windows 95 came out. Oh. So I'm not really sure how applicable that is, um, you know, 14 years on. Uh, and he's like, yeah, we, we should probably we should probably um, update this test at some point. And then I go in for the second interview and this guy lets me in the building. And he says, oh, you're here to see such and such. I said, yeah. So he says, OK, take a seat. I'll let him know you're here. Goes in, 10 minutes go by, 15 minutes go by, but there's no reception. There's like, I'm sat in a reception, but there's no receptionist. Yeah. Eventually someone comes down and sees me waiting because I can't in the building, I like, can't get anyone's attention. And I say, are you, are you okay? And like, anyway, I get let in and uh, the guy says to me, says, oh, was there traffic or something? I said, no, I've been here for like half an hour. Someone said uh, they'd let you in, uh, they'd let you know I was here, but I just didn't, no one told you. Um, and he's like, oh, OK. So um, so anyway, I'm doing the interview and he says, oh, I'll bring a colleague in. It's the dude that let me in from before <laughs> that didn't wow. tell him I was here. Uh, and I still managed to get the job. And I actually I actually asked about the test because I thought I'd failed the test and said, you know, you know, how, you know why? How did I get picked for this job sort of thing? This is like a few months on while I've been there for a while. Um, and he said, well, the other two people we had interview is we had a guy that was in his 60s interview and all the team were like in their early 20s um, and we just didn't think it'd be a great fit for him or for, for them. Um, and the other one was a, a young woman who uh, who everyone on the service desk said, hire her. I don't care what she scores on the test, just hire her, wow. uh, which is you, those, those young uh, men sort of thing. Um, she apparently looked at the test um, and then walked into the room and said, I don't think this job's for me and handed the test back to the dude. Oh. <laughs> so I kind of got the job by default um, without really getting a lot of the answers right, but hey, it worked out for that's me. Right. So. Amazing. That, that's cool. That's You know what, I don't say that that's not default, bro. You're in the right place at the right time being yourself. Yeah. There's no such yeah. thing as default. It's, mm-hmm. it, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, confusion there, but you know, got there. Do you have any good uh, interview stories, Chris? Uh, anyone you've interviewed or anyone you've interviewed for yeah that you can tell yeah i do i think um what i'm so i've I've always been the kind of person that when i interview i just want to be myself because my theory is is that if you go in not being yourself uh yeah and you start the job people are like oh what have i hired so um 
Yeah, I've always I've always been pretty like verbose and stuff. And you know, I said to one interviewee once, well, somebody that was interviewing me at least, I said, look, I'm not I'm not I, I just want to cut the shit. Like I'm not here to I'm not here to you know play games. You can ask me silly questions and that's fine. But I'd prefer to just understand what you're all about because, quite frankly, I don't want to move to a company where I don't fit in. And I'm, as you can see, pretty straightforward. And you know, and it was actually a super good conversation. Like. I can't say who it was, and it wasn't in this country, but the conversation that we had, I actually ended up, they they kind of offered me the job in a way that they were just like, well, if you are keen, come work here. And I was like, well, no, I think I haven't made a mistake. I'd like to stay where I am, but it's been super good meeting you guys. And actually what happened was they ended up being good mates of mine afterwards, and I ended up working with them sort of on the side, not on the side, but like yeah. in a more collaborative way. And also something else interesting is when I moved to this country, so I can't mention his name from Microsoft. There was a chap that interviewed me. So I basically got off the plane, started work, decided that I hated where I was working because it was the wrong place, right? Went for an interview at Microsoft. Person X interviewed me. We had the best chat. And he's like, dude, you need to go and get more experience in the UK because you're like, you're good, but you need more experience. Like you don't understand the UK market. And I was like, fair dues, because of the way you sell in South Africa, is very different to the way you sell in the UK. People in the UK are very skeptical. And South Africa can be quite an emotive market, very much to the States, I think, as well. Mm-hmm. So like I did the I did I got the I got the grass burns, I did the pre-sales thing, you know, did some good stuff with Hitachi, went back to Microsoft for the interview, and it was the same dude that interviewed yeah. me. Yeah. Completely different role, right? And um we sat down, had a discussion, and yeah, the, the interview went pretty well, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Cool. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, about you, Emma. Um, I met you for the first time last year in Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a great time, uh, me, you and Strott, uh, Amsterdam Summit besties. Um, but at the time, uh, you you weren't really um, doing many talks. Correct. Um, I, I don't think you had a blog at that stage. And mm-hmm. now over the last, like, 12 months I've seen you just explode in terms of everything you're doing um I remember one of the conversations we had was over um uh, certifications mm-hmm. um and I remember one of the things um because I was doing a talk on certifications and you came to to part of the talk uh, and you were saying to me that you were kind of um a little bit scared of of doing the certification which was afraid of failure and to me, that kind of all resonated in kind of that whole imp- imposter syndrome thing. And yeah. you've kind of taken that and you've just kind of run with it. And now mm-hmm. whenever anyone mentions imposter syndrome, the first words out of their mouth are usually go listen to Emma Darcy talk. <laughs> you know, you get packed crowds at, so- uh, at uh, Scottish Summit. Um, mm-hmm. I was in the room. Um, we, you did webinars for, for the CRM UG. Um, how does it feel now? to like be talking about imposter syndrome um and, and seeing like that that ma- well i've seen a massive growth in you i'm not sure whether you you can realize it um mm-hmm. because that's kind of part of imposter syndrome isn't it the yeah. inability to see your own accomplishments i've yep. seen such incredible strides from you in the last 12 months uh, how does it feel to be synonymous with something that is kind of known for being something that you're not supposed to be good at. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah. You know, I see you what you're saying. To... Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I think this is just kind of part of who I am as a person. I tend to take take things that I would consider have held me back in the past and then, you know, work on them and then share my experience with other people. The imposter syndrome thing has always been huge for me, especially when I uh, joined the pre-sales team at Click Dimensions because I was working under Matt Whitteman at the time. And as you all know, Matt Whitteman is a complete powerhouse of a human being being in the dynamic space, right? So for me, A, I was terrified that I wouldn't live up to his expectations. And B, uh, the whole pre-sales role always just seemed like, you know, everyone knew absolutely everything in this position. So imposter syndrome was really real for me when I took on that role. And then of course, two weeks later, Matt Wenneman left Quick Dimensions and left me completely by myself. <laughs> And you know what? Um, at the time, it was absolutely terrifying, but I could have either gone, I could have gone two ways, right? I could have either 
sat and wallowed and thought to myself, I'm never going to be good enough for this job and just, you know, always been mediocre. Or I could have taken and be like, okay, this is my absolute chance to shine and show everybody what I actually can do. And so that's what I chose to do was to basically take all these feelings that I was having, internalize them, realize that it was okay to feel the way I did, and then actually build up my self-confidence. And that's why I started the blog. And that's why I do a lot of the things that I do, because for me, imposter syndrome to me looked like everybody else around me in this community knows so much and knows way more than I do. And then I realized, well, they had to have started somewhere. So for me, after a really good conversation with both uh, Keith Watling and Sarah Critchley at Amsterdam Summit, I decided that I would kind of document my learning a little bit. So I went ahead and I started my blog, which was a really scary thing for me. I mean, as you guys probably know, when you start something, it's like, oh my God, is anybody actually going to listen to what I have to say? All that kind of stuff really went through my mind, but I was like, fuck it. You know, if it helps one person, that's really all that matters to me. And so the imposter syndrome talks have been mind blowing. I still, I still can't get over how much it's helped people to me that is it's very humbling (laughs) and I I do get really emotional about it at the Scottish summit thing you know I was both very hungover and very emotional during that talk I think the hangover actually really helped bring out a lot of that raw emotion Uh, but yeah 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 it was it was a really raw honest talk and look at how yeah 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 100% But just to touch on the exams a little bit, I think in the session in Scotland and something that really hammers home what imposter syndrome looks like is the fact that with the uh, MB200 exam, I rescheduled it eight times, which costs me more money in rescheduling fees than the actual cost of the exam itself, purely because I was so terrified to fail because I'm at the stage where, you know, people in the community think I know some things in my head I'm like I don't know anything and so if I fail this exam it's going to prove to everybody that I totally don't know anything and so that's why I rescheduled eight times and then when I went and took the exam I got like 875 or something super high yeah so you know I, I learned that I shouldn't be afraid of failure and that I can take something and if I fail it's not the end of the world but yeah there you go eight times rescheduling I'm sure that's a record dude yeah Fail fast, M. Like I've got this. I've got this theory. I failed. You know, the, this is my the most hilarious thing. The um, the M nine hundred. It's basically the fundamentals for modern workplace, which should be piss easy. I failed four times mm-hmm. because I even did the learning path and I failed it because I suck at security. Like my theory is, do it and fail. Who gives a shit? Carry on. Just and like, it, I think that what you do, especially with the talks that you have and the realness that you have, is that like. You learn in public, and this is this is. I think you're very you're very good at exposing that in other people and getting people to understand that that's actually okay. So, mm-hmm. like, when somebody and there are lots, can I tell you, there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people in the community that are like this that struggle to struggle to fail fast because they think that the repercussions are going to be terrible. Sarah yeah. Critchley once said something to me that was very important, hey, and I hope everyone listens to this. Stop making up fucking stories in your head, like. Think about it. it. It's bigger than you're making it, right? Yeah. So just if it's a problem, get it over and done with and move on to the next thing. And what you've done, I think, in the community, especially from the imposter syndrome side of things, and you taking taking the initiative to like get so involved is freaking awesome. So I respect that a whole lot. Thank you. Um, me too. Like I, I said, I I just seen such a change in you over the last you know twelve months that I've known you. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's incredible. I mean, the the whole exam thing, um, I totally get where you're coming from in terms of like failure, especially if it's not even you paying for the exam or an employer. Mm-hmm. There's kind of a extra pressure to not fail because they're relying on you. Um, and I think that's an, that's an added pressure no one needs when you're preparing for an exam. Um, yeah. But and again, Sarah Critchley keeps coming up a lot in this conversation. Um, I I watched Sarah Critchley give talks in Dublin. Um, about things like using cognitive services and the Azure service bus and all of these space age things. And then um, uh, Eugene London, she said, um, why don't people want to talk? Like, why do we have the same set of speakers all the time? Um, and I said, it's, it's a fair thing because I see people like you doing these things. I don't know half of that. I, I may know something really good, and but I don't know if people would be interested. And her response was, if you don't try, you don't grow. And that's I love that. important. 
like you know if failures are only um are, are only lessons that you've not learned yet mm-hmm. that's that's the thing is that you know if you fail an exam you know what you did bad on so you know what you can do better on next time because you know where to focus so uh like chris said i i think fail and fail quickly um but each failure is just a new lesson in your in your life and that's the end of my philosophical uh, oh, portion of this love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about you, Chris. Um, you have set up um, so many communities. Uh, you seem to be a person that brings people together. Uh, you're like a companionator, uh, yeah. if anyone gets that reference. Well, um, upsets everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't upset me. Um, yeah. So I, I was introduced to TDG through Ian Connolly, who we all know. Um, and he said, you need to go listen to this podcast. And it was three guys that were stood around a bar uh, with, a little, with a little sign that looks quite familiar in your background, um, uh, just talking about dynamics. How did TDG and then everything that you've done since then, how did that all begin? Like, why did you start doing all these things? Oh man, it's such a it's a it's a, it's a little it's a, the the story's slightly heartwarming but slightly sad. So, oh. Kyle Kyle Will and I worked for Hitachi at the time, and um you know Will was coming into the pre sales team. Kyle had just joined from South Africa in the old company that I used to work for from my old position, okay. which was then filled by Brett Rogers. For those of you that know him, wow. so Thank yeah, you. Kyle, yeah, dude, it's mental. So Kyle had moved to, into Hitachi, and we both had this. We all the three of us had this really awesome passion for problem solving and for community and um will had a back will had a site that he had created ages ago called that dynamic that, that dynamics guy i had one called um the dynamics revolution and kyle had one called something i think it was oh, i can't remember anyway we were just talking shit the one day and, you know we were used to sit around the bars drinking beer until we were absolutely mortal like talking dynamics i can't tell you why i still can't tell you why my process in our brains, the process in our brains would default to that. And Will was like, dude, we should start a club. And I'm like, yeah, we should. We should start a club. And I was like, yes, we should start a club. And then we thought like, well, the thing that we don't do very well is do things by the book. And we know we don't. And we never will. And we never have. And those of you that know me on this call know what I'm saying, right? So so we, what we did was we um, we chucked in some cash. Uh, we, we swore to each other that we would never let what we did be tainted by corporate or by our business. So we swore we would never take sponsorship and we swore we would never ever let other people like other organizations break what we had. And um, yeah, Will built the site. Um, we started promoting it. Carl bought the tech. I don't really know what I brought, the enthusiasm <laughs> maybe. And yeah, dude, it's just started like coming together. And the quicker we did this, the quicker it came together. And the more, like we did that video and we actually got asked to take the video down. And really? we did it. Yeah. We didn't take it down. We left it there. I was like, it's too late. <laughs> Video's up. What do you do? And actually, there were. it was used in a number of sales meetings from some, some organizations I can't name to actually promote people, right? To say, like, look at what these dudes are doing. Like, do something different. You know, put on a different set of shoes and walk a different road. Like, stop being so boring. And our goal was to make dynamics fun and to show people that it doesn't matter who you are, you can enjoy this as much as we do. And we got quite a, we got the reputation, like we ran the first ever Power Platform Hackathon, which was, hack, it wasn't even Hack for Good at that time, it was demystifying the common data service. And um, yeah, we ran that in the reactor, we had like 50 people and it blew up from there. It just went bonkers, like we had James Phillips register on the site and it went from 30 of us to 3,000 people pretty quickly at one point. Yeah, it was absolutely bonkers. So like, it was definitely down, and what we did, the thing that I think we did quickly was that we made it about the community so we didn't keep it to ourselves like we just gave we made we gave people jobs so we created community needs like and we said you manage the site and you do this and you do this and like just tell us what you want to do and it very quickly moved away from like those dynamics guys to tdg because it wasn't about us anymore it was about everyone else and that spawned into all sorts of spin-offs like God, I mean, they had TDGI at one point, which is kind of still running, which is for the global hacks, which has spawned into the hack for good stuff. There's Black Ops, which was before TDG, but then merged. There's just stuff that's come from it, right? And it's epic because I know people that have been part of the program have used some of the contributions to get their MVP statuses. 
there's been so what I want to say in like summary is that this has always been about people yeah. and it's always been about empowering other people and getting other people to do shit differently rather than just doing things by the book. So that's kind of how it began. And at the moment we're like, we're a bit split up now, not in a bad way. We're taking this time to refresh. Yeah. So watch this space. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that's the thing for me is that you're, you're kind of like a revolutionary. Um, you kind of, <laughs> you, you start the revolution, but as soon as that ball's rolling, no matter what you do, you can't stop it because yeah. it's then it's the people that are taken over. Um, Did- so. Exactly on that point, like I said to somebody yesterday, I'm like, you know what? You've got to treat it like a fire. You can chuck a blanket on a fire, but you better hope to hell that blanket doesn't get set alight. Because if it does, you are not stopping that fire. Yeah. And that's, I think, what's happened with um, some of the stuff that's happened in our dynamics community is that, you know, we, we've had stuff. Try, people have tried to snuff our stuff out. They have. They have tried to stop it. Guess where we are? Still there. Still yeah. going. And now there's a whole podcast about uh, about community members, which is what I'm trying That's to do. Awesome. So, um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about Hack for Good, uh, which was two weekends ago now. Have you have you both recovered? Because you're both like, Ooh. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it was absolutely chaos. It was so much fun. Just seeing the creativity that complete strangers could come up with together just blew my mind. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I enjoyed watching some of the videos. Uh, I think the Chris Bot was one of my favorite ones. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think we all need a copy of the Chris Bot solution um, for, for Jiggles. Um, but yeah, how many people did you have registered in the address? It was over, it was over 390. We kept it. So we didn't, quite honestly, we expected 50. So uh, yeah. like we, we, put out, we put out the limit at like 100 just to kind of be hopeful. And I remember saying to Donna, I'm like, dude, this is a risk, right? And I, you know, even even when M joined us as a as a um, time zone lead, I'm like, shit, I don't know if this is gonna, like you, when you do stuff like this, you just don't know, right? Yeah. And we, between you know the organization committee, we had less than two weeks to do it. Yeah. So it was kind of like we either flick the coin into the pond and hope for a ripple. Turns out we flicked a rock. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so we had it was over 390 registrations. Oh, I cannot literally tell you how many participants we had. They were, I, I don't know, we had no way of tracking it. Like, yeah, people coming in and coming out. And then this one was brought their friend. I mean, and you had people like a whole team just yeah. around. <laughs> yes, we did. I think one of the mistakes Chris made was putting myself and Andrew Welch on the same team because it oh. was just. <laughs> A non-stop badger, us just being like, look at this person's solution, drinking wine. It was just magical. I think I assembled some furniture halfway through it. I did, I did. I, I half assembled a dresser halfway through um, one of our team zone sessions. But yeah, it was absolute madness, but I would do it again in a heartbeat. And I think I signed up to do it whilst in a badger session. Chris was like, I need help. I'm like, oh, that sounds like fun. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, you know what I, I like. I genuinely think that the time zone leads that we had. So we had Emma and Andrew in the in the Americas. We had Lee, Lucy, well, Lilu, um, Allison, and I in the UK because the UK was just overrun with craziness. Well, sorry, Emia, and then Nijo came in from um, India. We had a whole. We had to add an entire time zone randomly yeah. two days before the event. We didn't plan on doing a, an India launch. We added a time zone randomly two days before the event because the registrations, and then um, Lisa and Lainey did um, did Australia, New Zealand, Singapore. It it was I, I will be deadly serious. Without those people, this thing would not have worked. Like one hundred percent. Yeah. It, yeah. They, they they the time zone leads probably took on the brunt of all the the frustrations because I have a problem, man. I'm like I'm like a rabbit from Winnie the Pooh. I'm yeah. a control freak and I can't let stuff go. And they did everything. I was I, I had the like honestly, Donna and I and Keith, we had the best people working on this. Yeah. yeah. Trying to try agree more with people you mentioned that. Um it's interesting that you you added India in um sort of last minute. I didn't realize, but as I look at the statistics for my blog and for my videos, I have quite a high proportion of people from India um, that, are, that are watching my videos and reading my blog, um, which is interesting because not that many people interact with them. But um, there's loads of views coming from those countries. Um, 
So there's definitely a big market there, but maybe there just needs to be a bit more community or maybe needs to be a bit more global community. But it sounds like sounds like there is a there is a community there. So huge, dude. Like so Donna Donna has been doing huge amounts of work in the IST time zones. Um, yeah. especially also within Nigeria, sorry, in and also the Emir time zones with Nigeria, yeah. um, Middle Africa. And I promise you, hey, like you must speak to Foyan. So Foyan's Foyan actually did the most amazing project with one of the banks in Nigeria. It's just unbelievable. Like the, the amount of people that are keen. I'm doing, I'm doing a user group tomorrow yeah. with the Nigerian team. Yeah, it's nice. The thing is what we what we do, what I think we sometimes do in this community, and sorry, I'm gonna ramble now, just shut me up. Sorry. Like Sometimes we can be quite insular, especially in Europe, because we're all yeah. friends, right? So we all hang out and like we pub it together, we go to the badger together, we go to events together, and we all know each other fairly well. But um in when you look outside of Europe, I mean, I still think personally, I'm I'm not gonna kid around. I think Europe slash UK is probably the hub, the global hub for the power platform, in my opinion. Yeah. But when you look outside, like we we're working and people like Keith Watling are doing this really well is from bringing other estates into this community. And we have to stop thinking it as like of the UK community. It's got to be the global community. And yeah. that's, I think sometimes we make that mistake. And especially like, I know Sarah's doing work on that as well. Another Sarah mentioned, there we go. Yeah. I know Critch is doing work on that as well. Lisa and Lainey are doing work. Nijo in India, oh my gosh, that guy, he is the most quiet, chilled out fella, but he is so amazing from an organizational perspective. And just as a human being, like, we have to find ways to rope more people in. And I think that that's what is happening right now, especially with what you're doing, because you're reaching different audiences. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, so, Emma, I want to ask you about D the Dunder Mifflin project <laughs> and your Twitch stream. So, you know, yeah. people people set up UGs and people set up, you know, yeah. I, um, the, f the first episode of this, um, just before I recorded it with Malin and Joe, Malin sent me a, a, a GIF that it was um, just because you're in lockdown um, and you're under 30, don't think it's a great time to start a podcast. And I'm just like, oh, well, I'll start. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit funny, but yeah. Um, so, um, but not a lot of people stream dynamic stuff. So yeah. where did the kind of idea from that come from? Is that from your gaming background? And, and what is the Dunder Mifflin project for those that don't know? Oh God, what, how do you define the chaos that that is? <laughs> um, so it all just, I don't know how the idea just came to me. I think I was just watching um, The Office one night and I was like, oh, I bet you I could build a power app to manage like the the, com the complaints that Dwight has listed against Jim. Actually, this is amazing. What if I build an entire like streaming service around it? And I guess the idea really came back to more teaching people that everyone has to start somewhere. And so when I do a live stream on Dunder Mifflin, um, basically what it is, we live stream business processes for the Dunder Mifflin for the office. So we implement like a service desk. We've implemented a dashboard for Pam to keep track of Michael's naps, all that kind of stuff. But the whole idea is basically to show people that the blogs and the content that you see out there in the community are all polished. They are, there's hours of work behind them. There's a lot of research behind them, but my process is basically showing people, well, here is the process to get you to the point of writing that blog. So it's very much a community project. Uh, it's myself, Mallory Lawhorn and Alison Fierce, two of my bestest, best friends. And we just hang out and we, we talk about the office and we come up with ways to implement solutions for the office together. But yeah, you're right. It does kind of come from my gaming background. It's on Mixer because Mixer is Microsoft streaming platform. So being the Microsoft fangirl that I am I'm staying in house with everything and yeah it's just it's just a ton of fun I will admit that I haven't been very good at getting on a regular cadence with it because sometimes you know life is a little chaotic and yes. I do intend on it getting there eventually just uh coming up with ideas can be a little hard sometimes yeah well I think you just moved as well so there's a whole disruption there so <laughs> yes. you know, occasionally you... you'll just see my sister walking in the background they're like who is that because <laughs> she looks like me we look very similar so like <laughs> I always have to double take when that happens. I'm like, yes. Do you know what you should do? You should move the microphone and just put your sister in the seat and just sort of like talk from the other side and she can try and move her mouth like a little bit. <laughs> <drink with Tommy. laughs> I should. It would be hilarious. She does have significantly shorter hair than mine, so the, the jig might be up. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to talk to you, Chris, about um, the Lords of Dogtown. So, oh, yeah. do you remember having this conversation with me a few weeks ago? I do, bro. Yeah. I do, and I still want to be the Tony guy. 
I want to be the guy that revolutionizes. Yeah. So the for those that don't know, the Lords of Dogtown is a is a movie sort of documentary about um, the the original people that that made Staten, um, who you know they they um, was, was it during the drought where all the swimming yeah. pools were empty? Yeah, that's yeah. it. They they um that's where that's where it, it's sort of like where skateboarding made it. Yeah, and you know a lot of people don't know about the history of these people. Um, they just try and know the Tony Hawks and the the, yeah. the ones that got famous afterwards. And we were having this conversation about the fact that there's so many people that have come before the people that we see now. Yeah. Um, do we still remember the other one, like the, the people that came before that, that basically trailblazed the path for the rest of us? So my foot, my, what I was trying to say to, to you is, do you remember where we first met? I do. It was at a user group. It was a user group yeah, in I, Manchester. Yeah, it was the Manchester one. I remember it. Yeah. yeah. I do. And that that event was the first time I met you, and you were doing a power apps um, like battle. Yeah, with Craig Bird. Oh man, yeah. my ass because the translator service never, ever, ever, ever will live that down. So, so yeah, so the, um, so they were basically they were the two of them were showcasing uh, different aspects of uh, of power apps. Um, so so uh, I think Craig had the translator service who translates something into Afrikaans and, and made everyone in the everyone in the uh, audience laugh. And Chris was embedding um, Canvas apps into model driven apps two years ago before it was even GA. Um, so the thing I'm I want to say to you is that. I just did a talk at Scottish Summit where I used the translation service um, to translate text and I embedded a model-driven app, a canvas app into a model-driven app and then got it to update stuff. And I'm doing that two to three years and presenting that two, three years after you originally did it. So like you were that trailblazer two, three years ago oh, and I'm only just starting to catch up to kind of that level of it. So um, I, you know, there's people like you uh, and, you know, uh, Keith and, and Sancho and all these people that kind of like just made these great impacts. Uh, and, I, and I don't think anyone's going to forget anytime soon about the people that, um, that of, of how we got here. Um, and even Andrew Welch was was talking about in his book as well that um, you know if we've seen further than other men, it's because we've stood on the shoulders of giants. You and people like you are the people that helped you know me and Emma and everyone else get to where we are now. So oh, yeah, man. big looks. We're gonna have like a little cry. Give me a second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, guys. This, no, this is just... where the video podcast won't go into. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. No, I mean, that means a whole lot. Thank you. Like, I've been struggling quite a lot recently with, like, value and figuring it out where my value is. Just, uh, there's just, like, lots of stuff going on in my head. And, um, no, that's awesome to hear. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Oh, it's, it's cool. well, it, it's all the truth, man. Um, so, I think one thing we have to do, and Emma kind of alluded to this at the start, was um, I decided to get a tattooed serum girl and a tattooed serum guy on the same podcast. I oh, think I'd be remiss if we didn't talk tattoos for a little bit. So oh, no. You, you don't need to show me your tats. Um, that's not what this is. Um, <laughs> I just kind of want to know, do you have any interesting stories about your tattoos? So I know, Emma, I know you tend to get tattooed in the countries that you visit. Uh, I remember yes. you, you sloping off to go get one in Amsterdam. Um, so <laughs> yes. do you have any interesting tattoo stories? The one from Amsterdam is probably my most favorite because it was when I did my first ever talk and it was for Extreme, which is a partner event that happens right before Dynamics uh, Summit. And um, I loved Amsterdam so much, I decided on the spur of the moment to get an Amsterdam tattoo. But I'd also just had um, wisdom tooth surgery, so I had some hydrocodone with me. And so when I went to get tattooed, I was like, oh, I have to give a talk right after I get tattooed. I'll just pop a couple hydrocodons. I'm sure I'll be fine. I, I, oh, my God, this is probably a terrible story to share with everyone. But I did. And I was very happy getting tattooed. Didn't feel a thing. All chatty. And then I get to my talk and there's like blood dripping down my leg from having just gotten tattooed. I'm fairly like Woo! having a great time. And it's my first ever talk. And Matt Wittemann's doing it with me. And I remember Matt saying, you have to either be drunk or hungover to do your first talk I was high on got your coat on giving my first talk ever and I blitzed through an hour worth of slides in 10 minutes 
That was my first ever talk, and that's why I got tattooed in Amsterdam. Nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wish I was there. It was, it was like, and here's how you do marketing, and everything is really, really fast. <laughs> oh, gosh, I'm really excited. This is how you do it on automation. This is flow chart. <laughs> yeah, I was. I think I was talking about workflows as well, so it was super boring. <laughs> I was <laughs> rapid speed. Okay, your, st your stoked face, it's the same as when Matt like, gets excited with flow. It's like, what if, like somebody can be chatting to you and then all of a sudden it's like, workflow, automation. Yes. <laughs> Matt had to take over and do an hour and 30 minutes worth of stuff on flow because I had blitzed through my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> he, was like, <laughs> he just sat there and he opened it his day. He was like, well, what are we going to talk about today? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like padding all the time out, you could. That's probably oh. the real reason he left. He was like, I am not working with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always so excited. She's, she's too much. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Do you have uh, any good tattoo stories, uh, Chris? Matt, you know what? I only have good tattoo stories. I've been tattooed. Oh my God. <laughs> Let's put it this way, right? Um, how am I going to explain this? I have a power apps tattoo tattooed on my back in the form of a tramp stamp in from Vegas. Ooh. I have, I have a flaming egg, just the egg flames on it tattooed on my neck with the flaming spatula tattooed on my cock. Yeah. I also, here's the best story. You right? said calf there, right? Oh, my cough, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I've got, no, I've got some weird stuff. I have... How big's the spatula? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty big, man. <laughs> it's that big. Definitely not a PG, uh, definitely not a PG-13 like, oh, uh, podcast. No, I don't have any of those ones. No, I've, I've got some weird stuff, man. Like, I, I think, I think the, I think the best one has probably got to be, I was in California, and uh, I was in Long Beach at my first extreme. And uh, I met, like, so when you, it's the second oldest tattoo shop in the world, right? And I wasn't speaking. I went there because it actually was like, dude, well done. You've done some good work. Go to Long Beach. I'm like, I don't know what you've done. <laughs> so I'm like, I went. And um, they've got a tattoo shop there. It's the second oldest one. And I, I just thought, you know, screw it, right? I just want to go and check out what's going on in this place. So I walked in and I said to the guys, listen, I have no, I know that you don't like do walk-ins and stuff. I just really wanted to see the place and everything. And I got chatting to this dude called Eric Branchfield. Um, awesome guy. Uh, so he like he was in a wheelchair, so like you know, busts away and like wheels up to me. He's like, hey man, I can see you've got some interesting stuff tattooed because I was wearing shorts and I've got two big leg pe leg pieces, right? So um, he's like, yeah, yeah, can I check them out? So I showed him and he's like, dude, let's get, I'll tattoo you right now, bro. What do you want? So I picked a Kelvin and Hobbs tattoo. You won't be able to see it, but sorry there, yeah. I picked a Calvin and Hobbes tattoo just like randomly and we sat speaking for about three and a half hours. A tattoo that should have taken an hour, it took three and a half. And we ended up just like hanging out outside the shop, like chilling out, you know. It was, it was just a really surreal experience. Like I've got crazy stories from tattoos, but I think that's probably my favorite one because like it was just Long Beach at its best. And that's what I loved about it. And it's, it's like one of, one of the ones I'll never forget because it was just really, really like real. It was great. Loved it. Yeah. Nice. Well, hopefully the, the next time I see you guys, I'll have my Microsoft T-Rex with a ninja cat tattoo done. That's scheduled to be done early June. So, Oh, oh dude, you're going to make yeah. something else weird now. Thanks, Emma. <laughs> we know about okay. the tattoo that we're going to get done in Vegas whenever that rolls around, but that is not something we talk about at this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, guys, not for the podcast. So. <laughs> and Man, it's pretty, I I have a do you know what I have a single tattoo. Um and the thing is, is that you know you know like the rules of tattoos. Yeah. So don't get barbed wire, uh don't get um like symbols in another language that you don't know what they mean. Um you know, don't get like you know, just just flames and stuff like that. Um well I got one of those. You got barbed um, wire, didn't you? <laughs> no, <laughs> the other barbed wire. So, oh, yeah, I don't it's like symbol. Japanese, yeah. that's cool. So, so this is my um, my year in the Chinese zodiac. Cool. Um, so this is this means dragon, and when yeah. I showed when I showed it to someone um, who's who's actually Chinese, he said you don't look like much of a dragon to me, and I was like, thanks. 
Oh, it's like wow. it's, it's it's my year in Chinese Zodiac. So the the reason I wrote tattooed was um, the the year I was born dictated a lot of things around me yeah. um, because I I had a lot of friends that were a lot older than me uh, and I was always kind of held back because of my age because I didn't really uh, get on with the people that were my age growing up. Uh, I always got on with people that were a lot older than me um, and it just kind of affected me a lot. So I kind of wanted something to remind myself of like where I came, kind of came from um in in terms of like the year i was born i thought it was a, a better thing to do rather than some you know a, a number or something like that uh but again that's you know that's the hipster version of of tattoos and, and everything else so uh, i don't have anything close to to you guys <laughs> it just uh, kind of happens though doesn't it like you don't go into life planning oh i'm gonna get heavily tattooed it just happens yeah, yeah it just, probably, it just happens. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever planned a single tattoo in my life without even kidding you. Not one. No. no. Um, uh, I am interested in the power apps one in terms of like, you know, uh, after each sort of like update to the Microsoft, do you kind of like go looking for the symbols? Like, is it still relevant? Is it trying to <laughs> that, well, that one I did. Do yeah. I need to cover it up sort of thing in the next session? The problem was, is that like I did it. I was very hungover, a huge surprise. And uh, yeah, the, um, the, the they did update the they did update the icons yeah and i was like Oof. close call but yeah i don't mind i mean dude i couldn't care i mean i've got some very very strange things i have i have one other thing to tell you before okay. i have my nickname tattooed on my side over here okay my nickname is scruff do not visit the website scruff.com it is for the more aggressive bear type man okay well, um, well, speaking of animals, um, that kind of that kind of nicely takes me on to a, a little game that I, I want to play with you guys. It was um, so so um, I set up a I set up a chat to try and coordinate the three of us getting together to uh, to do this. And um, one of the things Chris said to me is like, "We should we need like a virtual app thing that just generates animals and and stuff." Um, so I was like, right, I'm on this. Um, so uh, I spent last night uh, randomly, <laughs> randomly creating the random random animal quiz sponsored okay. by the Bespoke Badger. Badger. Not, re not really. <laughs> not really. Are we are we gonna keep score? Like, are we gonna pit? Are we gonna be like pitted against each other? Yeah. So we go. We can't. We can't. Do it. So we'll do. We'll do best. The best of four, I guess. Okay. Um, now it, it is a bit random, um, as in it uses a random thing. So we made it the same image twice. But what we'll do is we'll hit this button that says "Get me an animal." Mm -hmm. It'll display a picture of an animal, and then we can show the name uh, once we've guessed. So um, do we want to take it in turns, or do you want to just guess the same animal? I think we should I just shout each other. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, I'm gonna suck at this. Here's the first animal. Mole. <laughs> yeah. What one nil to Chris? Okay. I know my moles. You know your moles. Okay, right. Next animal. Is that a platypus? <laughs> beaver. It's a beaver. <laughs> it's a beaver. So if if, <laughs> if if you get the same animal, I'll just hit I'll just hit another button now. Okay. So we're close, we're close. You you really want a badger, don't you, Chris? I do, I'm dying, I'm dying. <laughs> okay. Right. Next next animal. Fox, dog, wild Coyote? dog. Uh badger. <laughs> what are those wild uh, dog things like called? Dog. What are those wild uh, dog things called? Are they not coyotes, no? No. So uh, this is... prairie dog. No, that's a <laughs> 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 I, do you know what? I showed this to my wife last night, and the names that she came out with for some of the animals were hilarious. Um, this, this, this is actually a dingo. Oh my oh, god! So this is this is taking us to uh, to Australia, right? Okay. So next one. So one 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 still. Right. Let's go with the next one. Squirrel otter. 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 Dude. That is an otter. Let me see a squatter. <laughs> Emma, dude, have you seen Will has made a squitten? He bought two yes, stuffed. Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
What is this? Squ- is it squirrel <laughs> kitten? A squirrel in a kitten, and he made one with stuffed toys. Okay. It's incredibly disturbing. I'm okay, so game. so we're on two ones, Chris. All right, come on, Emma. Right. I believe in you. I believe in I you. I do. All right, next one. Oh no, it's a dingo. Yeah. Get <laughs> Yeah, I'll give it to Emma. I'll give it to Emma. It's a kangaroo. <laughs> yeah, I'll give it to Emma. Okay. All right, so two, two. Right, come on. Right, oh. Next animal. Badger! That's a freaking badger! That is a badger! Is what that a wolverine? Of... Is it a wolverine? Ooh! It's a wolverine! Damn it, it looks like a badger! <laughs> it, does look, it does look like a badger. But it is a wolverine, so... So what was that? Is that three two to Emma now? Yeah. Was it two two? I can't hear. Yeah, three two. Right. Okay. Ne- we next. Next one. Edge. Bear. Yeah. <laughs> hey bear. <laughs> I love this day. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think that's, I think that's four two to Emma now. Uh, but we'll just continue until we get around all the animals. There's only a few more anyway. So, right, next one. Badger. Porcupine. Hedgehog. 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 Hedge. <laughs> What's oh, that? How do we? <laughs> it's a five two to. <laughs> Holy smokes! You're right. I've got you... badger in my brain. I can't remember yeah. the animals. <laughs> do you know what? There are badgers in this. There Spiky are. Spiky mouse. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Battle, battle mouse. Okay, next one. Badger. Oh, no, that's not, that's not. oh Badger, Spiky Mouse, Battle Mouse, Ewok. All right. Red Ghost. Janet. What is that? Do you know what that what is? is? That? It looks like a Janet. Um, <laughs> Janet? Hold on. Yeah, it's Janet. It looks like a Janet. Right, Janet. Not a Janet with an A. Is that a... Oh. No. Yeah, it is. Pokemon. I don't know what that is. Angry Ewok. This is an African civet. civet. Yeah. Well, that was especially for you, Chris. I would have thought you'd know that. I should have. Looks yeah. like do, you any, do you have any Irish animals in here, do you? <laughs> uh, come oh, on, yeah, Irish like, animals. like a leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually think to find Irish animals, but it's like, it's we don't horse. have any. It's a cow. <laughs> it's another horse. We've got, we've got foxes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think so. Uh, I think it's 5 2 still, I think, or 6 2. I don't know. We, we've, lost the plot. we've lost the plot at this point. So. Badger. Badger. So what what type of badger is this? Honey badger, brown it's... badger, an angry badger. <laughs> yeah, honey badger. <laughs> so I sh- th- I showed this picture to my wife, and my wife's like, "What is that?" And she's like, "It's a stunk bear." <laughs> it's a stunk bear. <laughs> oh, please uh... tell me she actually. <laughs> it's a bear. Yeah. Yeah, she did call it a stunk bear. She's like, what's that? It's a stunk bear. <laughs> so, uh, was, I think there might be another badger in here. But, uh, uh, what else, what else we got in here? Oh, uh, he's trying to room now. Oh, here we go. Kangaroo. You know what that is? That is oh, not a kangaroo. Oh, I know what that is. I've seen wallaby. One of the creatures of the deep. So, uh, but yeah, I think that's... Oh, do you know what oh, that is? That's no, it's uh, that no. I can't call it a dusty. No, yeah. it's it's called a dusty in South Africa. It's called a cocker. Cocker. Yeah, no chance, yeah. man. Uh, I think they're from a small island off New Zealand. Dude, they're freaking they're, awesome. <clears throat> they're the happiest oh, yeah. animal, and they, there's there's videos of people taking selfies with crockers. It's brilliant. Yeah. So, right, I think that's all of the pictures um, so, yeah, that, that I have. Um, I, I made this very quickly. Oh, there's another one. What's that one? True. It's Bandicoot. Bandicoot. Yeah. So this is a very quick quiz. I should have made it better, but I, I just thought it would give us a bit of a laugh at the this end. This is amazing. Um, I think I win, though, right? I, yeah, I won the oh, you definitely animal quiz. Win. I just, you're just lucky. I conceded. 
I just gave, I gave you the win. Just My favorite thing was when we both yelled, porcupine, hedgehog! <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude. It's, it's, a, it's, just, it's a battle mouse. It was just, <laughs> it was just all the, ba- it was just all the badges. It was actually just made. Can I ask, did you wear this shirt specifically to antagonize me today? I actually did. I did indeed. I'm very yeah. glad you picked that after Ooh. our discussion at Scottish Summit. Boo. The dogs suck. <laughs> what? <laughs> Hashtag go pens. Sorry, I don't know who they are. I'm, I'm not famous <laughs> enough. <sighs> Wow, fine talk. Yeah, well, I think I think maybe we should uh, we should call this quits before uh, before you guys come to blows. Keep this uh, keep this civil after the uh, after the battle of the animals. Um, but before we wrap up, is there anything uh, either of you two are doing at the moment that you want to advertise or put out there? I'm doing some things, I'm writing some blogs. I'm doing yeah. a lot of stuff around marketing and campaigns right now, which is a lot of fun. I've been reading it. I'm looking forward to the next bit. So yeah. I'll I'll link your blog uh, in the in the links. Chris, you uh, are you creating any more hack for goods? Are you, are you taking over the world anytime soon? Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. We got we got the uh, what, you just keep an eye on the events hub. I'm busy consolidating all the hack for good solutions into Git. Um, so those I'll share as soon as they've shared already. Actually, so you have access to them. I just need to get them all in there and then do the list. So yeah. If you're looking for anything to help you out with COVID-19 or your organization and you want to get some good ideas or look for some actual solutions, um, I'll send Matt the link. You can probably get, grab it in the show notes. Yeah, perfect. So I'll drop them all. Join us uh, in the Badger on Thursdays. Yeah, yeah. come join us in the Badger on Thursdays if you want a virtual pub to uh, to while away the hours. And uh, I think last weekend it, last week it finished about 6 a.m. 6 a.m. So, um, so yeah, it was a good job. It was Bank Holiday Friday in the UK. Yeah. Um, for, for some people. So, uh, but yeah, uh, can I just take this time to thank you both once again? You are absolute legends. Thank you for giving up your time to uh, to talk to me tonight. I've had an absolute blast. Dude, thank you for having us. You're amazing. Thank you for making the greatest game, second greatest game in the world, first greatest game in the world. It's always going to be, ah, oh, I've forgotten what it's called. I'll think of the name. <laughs> It's similar to it's, Penny Cam it's, from. It's so good. Penny Cam from Cougar Town. Yes! Penny, Penny Cam! <laughs> Wait, can I show you guys one last thing? Yeah. Have you ever seen anyone do a one handed clap? Okay, Sound of what? People like this, Matt, I'm going to give you a one handed clap. Yeah. This is the funniest thing. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> One-handed clap. I that's uh, drink, clap. That's uh, from The Simpsons, isn't it? It's like Lisa says to Bart, like, what is the sound of, of uh, one hand clapping? And she, and Bart's like this. <laughs> and Lisa's like, no, it's supposed to be a metaphor for life. You can't hear a single hand clap. You need someone else in your life. To complete. <laughs> and he's like, just like, no, Lisa, this. <laughs> I love you guys. Oh, we love you. So thank you both um, for for joining me today. Um, And uh, hopefully I can give you both hugs in real life very soon. Oh, I'm getting a weird. (laughs) (laughs) You smell good, man. Thank you. Bye.